another sort of, I think, research gap is the sex differences. And it's it's a it's definitely of, of interest to many, many women of all stages of life. Um, so acknowledging the research gaps, I'm still going to ask you some opinions to see if there are any. Uh, I know I know there's also, I think, some um, misconceptions in the, in the general audience in the with the general population also. Um, so it'd be nice to kind of even touch on some of those. Um, one being, you know, postmenopausal women, like, is hit good or bad for postmenopausal women? Like, on the bad side, some women are worried about raising cortisol too high. Um, do you have any thoughts on doing hit for postmenopausal women? So, so specifically on the cortisol um, level, and again, I think the latest systematic reviews, meta analyses, you know, the studies vary a little bit, but by and large, I don't think individuals need to worry about chronic increases in cortisol levels systemically that are gonna cause them damage. Clearly cortisol levels can go up just like catecholamines go up acutely during exercise. But I think there's some evidence now that would suggest that actually in individuals that practice interval training, basal cortisol levels actually stay lower than prior to, to baseline. So I don't think it needs to be a major concern especially given a lot of the other benefits that we can see with this type of, uh, of, of approach. So that, that's, that's on the, 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 the cortisol issue um, specifically. Yeah. And that, I mean, given all the benefits we've talked about, the cardiorespiratory, the muscle, you know, skeletal muscle, you know, the brain, I mean, there's just, it's, it's, it's pretty clear to me that, I mean, It'd be hard. It'd be a hard sell to say, "Oh no, it's not beneficial for postmenopausal exactly. women." I you know, eat, you know. And very different is you know uh, uh, individuals with uh, PCOS, um, polycystic ovary is. There's ongoing work, uh, some really good work out of Norway, uh, looking specifically at HIT in uh, in individuals with that condition, so showing some uh, some real benefits there. On the sex based uh, differences, you know, writ large, are there. Uh, sex-based differences in some outcomes? Uh, yes, I, I, I think they're subtle. Um, at least the evidence to this point would suggest there are some differences. They're probably subtle differences, but we knew we do need to know a lot more. Uh, you know, are there massive differences between, for example, phases of the menstrual cycle or oral contraceptive users versus uh, naturally cycling uh, females? Again, maybe some, but probably pretty subtle. So that doesn't mean they're not important, but I think the differences uh, are, are likely small in, in most um, outcomes. Uh, but absolutely, we just you know need more research. We, we need more research on diversity of responsiveness writ large, not necessarily even just biological males and females. You know, and you've talked about this on other episodes. Um, you know, it's an active area of research and it's a frustrating area of research sometimes. So I'll give you a very specific example. Some of our research right now is looking at the mechanisms for the increase in VO2 max with very short sprint type interval training, right? And so we know that that increases VO2 max, but we're not sure why. And actually some of the work would suggest maybe it's more the muscle adaptations than we thought about, or at least the cardiac output changes take a while. So I have a PhD student immersed in this area. In his first study, we show that VO2 max goes up, stroke volume was up, cardiac output was up after 12 weeks of training, and it looked like there were some differences between the males and female participants in the study. So we did a secondary analysis, wasn't appropriately powered, and we thought, yeah, actually it doesn't look like the women are responding very much, or the females, and the, male, the males are. So then we repeat the whole study using more best practice procedures, properly controlling for menstrual cycle phase and uh, properly expressing fitness per fat-free mass. And we were basically unable to replicate the original findings. And we certainly didn't see any evidence of a sex-based difference, which tells me something that we've hand waved around a little bit around our conversation at this point. There's tremendous inter-individual variation in responsiveness. And so at least right now to my mind in terms of potential differences in responsiveness to specifically sprint type training it might be less about a male or female biology issue and it might just be 
there's tremendous variability between individuals. And in the almost 40 participants in the combined two studies, it happened to be men, people identified as males that uh, responded to a greater extent, but it, it might not have anything to do with biological sex. And I think that's where a lot, many areas are right now, not all of them. Some there's very clear differences, but uh, I think that's where the exercise field is writ large. And the vast majority of studies have not incorporated these best practices for making um, systematic comparisons between sexes. Right, yeah. And also I think, you know, differences in like, at least for me, it's like there's envir there's environmental, like how much sleep I got, like things that'll also affect, you know, my ability to perform and, um, you know, things like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of gaps in the field and, um, you know, with respect to women and menstrual cycle, that's also a question I get a lot. And I, you know, the, I think the reality of it is that, you know, 20 to 30% of menstruating women are, you know, during their menstruation are iron deficient and they just don't even know about it. They don't even know about it. They're not thinking about it. They're not increasing their dietary intake of iron. They're not supplementing with iron during that period. And maybe that alone also would affect some, I mean, iron's important for heme, right? And that's- No, no the other is, and if you talk to these female athletes, they're like, even if there is, I don't get to pick when my race date is. I know I have to peak for this day in four months time, <laughs> you know, in this location. Maybe you can structure your training around menstrual cycle a little bit, but I think the reality that that's just the reality, obviously for women who compete in, in sport. And so, yes, we need to know if there's some differences there, but in the big picture, it, it, it doesn't really matter. It's just one more thing that potentially contributes to variability and responsiveness on the day. And you try and control all the other things as well as you can, you know, to, to, to peak as best you can on the day or your event or your key event. Uh,